and a stack of food that is accumulating here like the Leaning Tower of Pizza. Speaking of pizza, nobody has brought us in pizza in a while, Bill. Yes, unfortunately. We gotta get that on the list. <laughs> Put that on the list. Yeah. And you know, for during the campaign season, every candidate must be required to come in studio. They cannot bring goodies in if they do it uh, communicate just by telephone. That's why uh, Mike Allers Jr. is now on Bill's <laughs> list. You're on the list. Well, Mike. if he can call into the show, he can call in DoorDash. Can he? <laughs> That's right. I mean, sure we come on. <laughs> That's a great point, John. You know, come on, Allers. What's going on with this? <laughs> Well, listen, guys, thank you for having me on. I promise, hey, next time I'm in the studio, I'm going to bring you the best pizza in the panhandle, Brothers in, Char in Charlestown. It is the best. First and foremost, le let me say that I agree with you because I discovered that place in the 90s. I would get the Sicilian cut pizza, and I would I'm actually oh – I've driven from Frederick to Charlestown to get that pizza. You are spot-on accurate there. It's yeah, yeah, and I'm originally from New York, so, you know, I – I can say I know my pizza. <laughs> so, yeah, Mike, we appreciate that, but how does that take care of us Doesn't today? Help us at all right. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're today's the day. We're, we're, yeah. we're living in the presence, not the future. Dylan, what's happening, hey, man? Listen, in, in Biden's economy, everything's expensive, right? <laughs> I promise I'll get to next time. You're going to get on Bill's bad side. Hey, go ahead, Dylan. I, I will say that uh, Colin McLaughlin, Nick Verzellini, when they come in here, and I, and I agree with them. They, they've been saying, man, it's always dessert in here. But when we come in, it's it's lunchtime. We could, we could use some lunch items every once in a while, you know? <laughs> Look, see that? The gallery is now parking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys are getting me hungry, and I had a good breakfast. So. Yeah, man. Uh, Mike Lee, and we are talking with Mike Allers, Jr. He is one of three Republican candidates in the House of Delegates race for the 99th. This is the seat where Wayne Clark is the incumbent. We spoke with Daphne yeah. Andrews last week and uh, Mike with a final chance uh, here today. Uh, Mike, uh, let's uh, let's talk about you. Uh, what do you do for a living, sir? Absolutely. So I'm a teacher, first and foremost. I'm a teacher and conservative commentator. All right. Where do you teach or where have you taught? So I actually, I actually teach right now in, in Frederick, Maryland, and part of the reason I wanted to dive into this race is because you know, teacher pay is very important to me. And as the panhandle grows and it becomes more expensive to live here, a lot of people can't afford to teach in the panhandle, so we have to go out of state for work. So I actually teach in Frederick. Before that, I taught in northern Virginia and made the commute from the panhandle mm. as well, like a lot of my neighbors, actually. Where do you teach in Frederick? Uh, Monocacy Middle School. It's a wonderful school. Oh, I, I you know, um, Mr. McVeigh then. Yes. I think, is he vice principal there? Uh, he used to be. Yeah, okay. Is he, he, does he move to a different school? Yeah, new new administration. Okay. New administration. Very good. Yeah, he's uh, he's coached. He, I used to coach with him. So uh, anyway, so you're one of the people who, when we talk about teachers needing locality pay, they yeah. j jump the border and go work somewhere else where they can where they can make more money. Yeah, and and to be honest, look, it, it bothers me. I believe you should teach in the community you live in, but if that community is unaffordable, you have to do what you have to do, you know, to provide for your family. I have a, a three year old son. I have a daughter on the way, so I have to make that commute. Um, and I definitely want to change that because we're losing so many teachers. Because, like you said, it's a twenty minute drive, and you're making twenty grand more. Yeah. So, so everyone in my area is going to be making that drive, especially if they're an educator. So absolutely it is important that we pay our teachers what they're owed. And what, how, do, what do you teach, Mike? Uh, sixth grade language arts. Okay. All right. And how do we solve this problem, Michael? Well, look, I know a lot of people have fought for locality pay, and we absolutely need to keep pushing on that. But a lot of people, uh, especially that represent the Panhandle, have just left it as, well, we tried. We could try again. But, you know, no one's budging. Well, something dramatically needs to be done, whether that is through the legislature um, passing something or it's done by executive order. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, actually very conservative in Arkansas, raised the teacher pay in Arkansas from 35 to 60. And what she did was she cut the fat. Now, in education, there's a ton of fat. And I'm a big supporter of public schools, but the problem with public school and why people are bothered by it is there's a huge bureaucracy. So we could start there. Number one, we have to see these budgets. Number two, we have to see 
basically the administration that's staffed. So all these positions in central office that are 80, 90 grand are not necessary. Those could be money that could be dissolved and funneled down to our teachers without even raising taxes. Bill? Yeah, uh, Mike, you, you mentioned locality pay, and certainly that is a, a major concern, and we've, we've talked about it quite a bit over the last years. Uh, yes. The last 30 minutes, though, we were talking about a, a particular middle school in Berkeley County, uh, that, and okay. you may have heard about it. So, yes, in Martinsburg, yeah. North Middle. So the uh, locality pay is a part of the problem, but it's not the yeah. only problem. So how would you address the other problems, the other problems of, uh, of uh, uh, school discipline, of uh, our test scores, our uh, security of the schools? There's a whole list any of problems sure. that need to be addressed. So my, my dad was an administrator, uh, and, and he was a principal for a long time. And 20 years ago, uh, and this was the case everywhere, basically the principal was allowed to govern their school. They had autonomy of their school. Obviously, that's a report to their higher-ups. But they had autonomy when it came to discipline, when it came to the culture of the school. Now, everything, because of the bureaucracy, goes to the central office. So if there, let's say a student brings a knife, okay, and the principal wants to suspend that student, well, central office could step in and say, yeah, keep him home for a day, but he'll be back in two. So the principal's hands are tied. The teacher's hands are tied. And our public education system is held hostage, okay? This also has to do a lot with not only the bureaucracy, but also the superintendents. I'm the only person in this race pushing for the fact that superintendents should be publicly elected like they do in North Carolina and Florida, which is the ultimate school choice, and would be able to give parents a say because they're, they're ultimately in charge of the district. So we automatically, I think, have to give power back to our principals, gut the bureaucracy, and really hold uh, kids accountable, support our parents, and support our teachers because not only are we being underpaid, we could be dangerously hurt in school. Uh, Mike, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. Um, hey. I, I think you're going to – it's a nice plan. Uh, I think you're going to run into a roadblock sure. of the West Virginia Constitution, which uh, is pretty much dictating a, a top-down approach to all of this, and that establishes mm -hmm. the State Board of Education, as as I yeah. understand it, as, as a Charleston organization. So what you're proposing, is, as I see it, is a pretty slow-motion – uh, constitutional amendment kind of approach is am I misinterpreting this well well look if we were able to light a fire under everybody if we're able to pass an amendment that would allow publicly elected superintendents that would put a check on the Board of Education um, and basically pick up where amendment four failed because I, I wanted amendment four to pass we really desperately need oversight um, but amendment four was voted down this would if we were able to light a fire under everybody like I said um, and we're able to pass that amendment um, to put a direct check on them. So on issues, we, we can't get locality pay passed. We couldn't get Amendment 4 mm -hmm. passed. How are we going to change the structure of, of the Constitution in, well, in Charleston? Look, it, sure. It, it's also about how you sell things, right? Like Amendment 4 uh, was strategically tied to Amendment 2. Right. In, in those ads. And a lot of people are like, well, uh, they're going to try and dissolve the school board. They're going to do some sort of takeover of my school. And the Republicans did not wage a pretty good PR war, I think, to get Amendment 4 passed. So it does come down to messaging. I think it, it needs to be a new approach. Obviously, there's a good old boy network in Charleston. You guys have, have heard all about that for years and years and years. There needs to be a new approach and there needs to be an aggressive approach, I think. Someone that's going to go down there and shake things up and... I'm going down there to do things. I'm not there to make friends. I do not mind stand, standing alone, but I can work with anybody. And I do think in order, if we are truly serious about being the party of education and fixing our schools, it starts here. If we don't, then we're going to continue to complain about how the wokeness has infiltrated our schools, how our teachers are being understaffed and locality pay can't happen. And we're just going to keep complaining and not do anything about it. So this would be a fresh approach to the situation. But it occurs to me, what you just said there, you, you, you're willing to stand alone. You're not going down there to make friends. It's mm -hmm. a collaborative body down there. And it occurs to sure. me that for people who are going to Charleston, in order to get anything done, it's, it's a body of compromise. And mm -hmm. you have to be willing to 
give something up to get something. Sure. You have to be willing to compromise. So in order, and I don't know, we haven't really gotten to what's near and dear to your to your heart in terms of, sure. of what are your hard lines here. But one of those things, whatever it is, has to be, you have to be willing to walk away from it perhaps to get somebody from the southern part of the state who is inherently resistant to locality pay to vote for locality pay for, for the eastern panhandle well, so it, that they it, can it get what they this, want. John. It would also be this. Look, someone in the southern part of the state, um, I'm for raising teacher pay across the state. I mean, like I said, Sarah Huckabee Sanders did it through executive authority. And Arkansas is poorer than West Virginia. They do not have as many resources as West Virginia, and she was able to do it. So I think a pay increase is required across the state because even though we're suffering in the eastern panhandle because of you know, the D.C. being in the D.C. area and being able to keep up in inflation and the like, you know, if a teacher downstate is still making 35 grand, that is still not enough because they're dealing with the same type of issues that we're dealing with across the state. So that school in Martinsburg that was deemed unsafe, I bet you that's the case across West Virginia. So it really needs to be across the board. And look, I believe in the Reagan doctrine getting 80 percent, you know, of what you're fighting for and taking, a, you know, the L on that 20 percent but you know that's why i'm anxious to get down there and hopefully the roadblocks in the way or those that have stood in the way hopefully they get out uh they get voted out tomorrow mike what would you bring to the to the voters that uh that wayne clark is not able to bring sure well the biggest thing you know i knocked 100 doors saturday and wayne clark likes to say that he's a guy that shows up and he's the guy that does the job not one person of those 100 voters, and it's not hyperbole, knew who the representative was. They were Republican. They did not know who Wayne Clark was. They have voted Republican, but they did not know who this man is. So I want to be an accessible delegate. I want to be get down there fighting for those people, but I want to have my cell phone available. I want people to call me. I want to go to their house. I want people to know who I am. And it seems like the people of the 99th have no idea who Wayne Clark is. That's first and foremost. I want to be accessible. I want to be a delegate that you know is working for you. And if I'm not, I want you to hold me accountable directly. Mike Gallows, Jr., our guest here on the program. He's a candidate in the 99th. That's a three-person race in the primary. Uh, Mike, you're for the uh, total repeal of the state income tax. Over what time yeah. frame are you comfortable with that taking place? Um, you know, whether it is drawn out for, like, you know, the next two years, as long as it gets done. I mean, you know, yes, we were able to reduce it, but it absolutely needs to be done. Similar states uh, to us, like New Hampshire, they completely repealed it. They're booming in business, okay? And they're a rural state. They're positioned next to, you know, the mass markets, you know, of, of New England, like Boston. They were able to repeal it, and they have a huge amount of business. That would be a huge help to our businesses, especially our small businesses as well. Um, and that would lower taxes for everybody. So as long as it gets done, uh, hopefully within the next, obviously my first term, if I'm fortunate to be elected, I'd like it to be done by the end of that term. That would mean that in two years' time, I believe you'll have to replace about $2 billion in tax income. How would you replace? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of a chunk to try to replace in two years. It is. It is. But And look. I'd have to go down there, obviously, to look at the specifics. Um, you know, I, I do know we, we do have a surplus, and obviously those things should be shifted around. Um, we would have to replace that. Uh, but I think it's definitely worth looking at, especially as states that repeal, that income tax entirely seem to be doing well. So I'd like to go down there and carefully study a little bit more on those states. There's a system in place now that has a, a bunch of mathematical triggers in place to continue to lower the state's income tax based on hitting certain benchmarks, certain readings of the federal, uh, the national economy, and such. Would you keep that system in place, or it sounds to me like you're trying to accelerate the system? I would like to accelerate the system. You know, I, I, I don't want to throw out, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but I, I definitely believe that program should be accelerated, especially I believe it's a conservative thing to do to completely get rid of the income tax. Mike, uh, on a scale between the uh, uh, Department of Commerce uh, Republican to a social warrior Republican, where do you see yourself? Uh, I'm, I'm a Trump Republican. I'm an America First Republican, you know. So I'm going to stand with working people. I'm going to put their interests first, and I'm always going to have their voice. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a populist Republican, 
and and that's where I fall. Um, you know, obviously, I believe I'll put small business over big business any day of the week. I believe that's true to West Virginia values, and I think that's in the West Virginia tradition. Um, so, yes, I consider myself a Trump Republican. You are a teacher. Should you win the election, mm -hmm. how do you get out 60 days to participate in the legislative session? Sure. Well, and this is why, uh, obviously, look, I think we need more people participating, you know, that aren't just lawyers where those jobs are a little more flexible. Luckily, Maryland would allow me, uh, you know, hopefully I can come on over to West Virginia once we get that pay uh, increase and uh, hopefully Biden's out of office to lessen inflation. But that is my goal to obviously teach in West Virginia and uh, make the hiring practice even easier. Uh, but Maryland would be flexible with allowing me 60 days to serve. Final minute is yours, Mike. Go ahead and campaign for the office. Sure. Well, look, guys, thank you for having me. Sorry I don't have any food, but I am going to bring change in the 99th. Um, even though I did not bring pizza to you this morning. I believe in severe education reform. I believe in establishing a culture of life and supporting our parents, growing a culture of family. And I think that should be that way across the Panhandle and West Virginia. And I want to empower the Eastern Panhandle economically. And I really want to bring change. I want to serve you in the 99th. I encourage you to vote Mike Allers, Jr., May 14th, uh, tomorrow. If you want a delegate that you will actually know by name and that will actually work for you. Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. Best of luck to you in the upcoming election. Thank you so much, guys. And I, I promise, this is not empty promises, you will get a Sicilian next time I'm in the uh, studio. <laughs> <laughs> Holding them to it, baby. <clears throat>